Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming out to YAML and YAMLScript. Um, so this talk is in something I wrote, I think, in 2008 called Vroom, and I've done every talk I've done since then. Um, it's basically Vim. That's all it is uh, with some, some nice little additions. Uh, you can, it's a Perl module. You can install it with cpanm Vroom if you so wish. Anyway, uh, so let's start with some icebreakers. So who has used YAML before? Some, everybody. I even talked to the EOS guys and all the, you know, I didn't know embedded, but they, everybody uses it. It's crazy. Um, so who uses it primarily for uh, software configuration of other people's junk? Mm, okay. Um, who's used YAML, written a program that has to load YAML? Okay. Less and so. YAML used from a program has two API functions, uh, dump and load. So who has used dump? All right. That's, I was surprised because everybody just uses this as a config language and loads it. So um, who knows that JSON is a complete subset of YAML? Interesting. Good. Um, and Hacker News... You know, they attacked us about a couple of years ago saying they found five areas and we, we actually sat down with the core team and we debunked every, we didn't know, you know, we, but we debunked everyone. So as far as we know, to this day, there's not a single known case where JSON is not, uh, any JSON is not valid YAML with the same meaning. Um, and who heard of YAML script since before this conference? Only Mark, because I told him about it. So, uh, okay. Did you? Okay, that's great. Oh, yeah, there was a, an article came out or something like that. Yeah, that's cool. So my name's Ingi.net. Um, I invented YAML in 2001. Uh, and now I'm the lead, the only guy left standing, the lead maintainer of the YAML language. Um, I call myself a polyglot acmeist open source library author. So polyglot means programming in multiple languages. Acmeist is just insanity. It means every library that you publish, you try to publish in every language, you, you know, so um, it's, it's like a dream that I'm working towards, but um, I'm getting close. So I have a lot to show you today. Um, I probably won't take questions till the end, and I probably won't have any time to take questions at the end, but I will hang around for as long as you want to outside and answer any questions that you might have. So um, save them up, and if you don't get a chance to talk to me, go to yamlscript.org slash about, and you'll find information about how to chat with me if you wish. Okay, so what is YAML? YAML is a, a data serialization language, so you can dump anything, any, anything in memory, and load it again, and you get back that same anything. So JSON serializes stuff, but it's not a complete, I wouldn't call it a serialization language, nor would Wikipedia, I think. So, um, but it's much simpler, and, and it's very solid. I have no disrespect for JSON whatsoever. It's, it's, um, it's awesome. So um, YAML wasn't actually intended for configuration. We talked about use cases back in 2002 or 2003. It's like, what are we going to use this thing for? Um, the other two guys that developed it with me uh, were solving XML, and I was trying to do um, data sharing between languages back at the time. Um, so, but it certainly has become a, a configuration language. That's just what people use it for mostly these days, 90%. So. Um, okay, so let's compare YAML and JSON a little bit. So um, JSON's a subset. Let's take a look at that and see how that is. For those who don't know, YAML has this uh, key colon uh, value type of thing that you come to expect, but you can also use uh, square brackets and curly braces to do uh, arrays and mappings or hashes. Um, and you can use the quotes or not, just like you can do in what's called block mode. So block mode is what you're used to with YAML most of the time. And flow mode is this json -y thing. Okay. Um, so uh, J YAML and JSON, they share the same data model. So <clears throat> uh, uh, scalars are things that are just single units. They can be strings, numbers, booleans, nulls, and sequences and mappings. It's just, you know, most languages, dynamic languages, share that same kind of data model as well. So it fits well, as does JSON into dynamic languages. So here's some scalars, uh, sequences, and mappings in both the flow and block forms. Not too much to look at here. This is not that interesting. But um, YAML adds structural features to JSON. And it, 
when I say it's not like we started with JSON, they were both started in 2001 and heard of each other in 2005 when this one, they, you know, we, we didn't know about them, they didn't know about this. But, um, but when you're comparing the two, these are the things that, that YAML has structurally that JSON doesn't have. It has anchors and aliases, which are like a, um, names and pointers to things, uh, tags for custom types, uh, implicit tagging, look, actually every node gets internally tagged as it's being loaded up, and the, the tag is what tells what function is gonna turn it into a native data thing at the end. Uh, YAML files or streams, as we call them, can have multiple YAML documents. Uh, it's not very often used, but um, it will be more, as you'll see later in the talk, and non-string mapping keys. So you can actually have a hash be the key of a hash if you wanted to. Um, not many languages support that, but some do. So let's take a look at those things. Um, here we name this mapping, and then we refer to it back here as star Alice. Um, here we're actually using this array of three things, which are is the RGB colors. Um, as green, and these unquoted values, if they're of the 0x uh, number form, turn our hexadecimal representations of integers. Not stuff you see very often, but uh, just pointing it out. So. <clears throat> and syntax-wise, YAML um, adds comments, uh, five different ways to do scalars, and the block and flow that we already saw. So we'll take a quick look at that. Um, I just don't know what happened there. So I'll just point out that we call unquoted scalars or strings in YAML, we call those plain scalars. And that's important for later in the talk, so remember that. And also a literal is like a here document um, where you just indent uh, any text over and um, it represents that text. So um, those are some nice ways. Uh, single quoted doesn't have any escaping and double quoted has lots of escapes. So those are kind of the difference. And folded, you should avoid, in my opinion. <laughs> um, let's continue. So, okay, so the nice things about YAML is it's a minimal syntax. It's easy to make YAML files. You just grab data and put it in the right places. You don't have to do a lot of quoting or extra syntax stuff. Um, it's very readable by non-programmers. I designed it so my mom could read it. And um, somebody pointed out, actually, our friend Mark, who's nodding off, uh, Brian pointed out that lawyers could read it, and that was uh, like an aha moment for him. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, like I said, you can encode complete text files, even other YAML files, just by indenting them with, the, with that um, literal syntax. And it round trips, yeah, round trips well within any given language implementation. It doesn't round trip so well, as we'll see. So YAML has these problems. Every implementation is different. It has a different API, different features, different bugs. It's, it's kind of a mess. Um, the spec is complicated. Anybody who's looked at the spec, it's, and who's actually finished reading it? I, I, I hadn't until I had to put out the last version a couple years ago. So um, yeah, it's, it's dense and hard to implement. Um, comments are not in the data model. A lot of people like comment round tripping. Um, and some people have implemented over YAML. Um, anchors and tags are they can be useful, but they didn't turn out to be that useful, and people don't use them much, and that's fine. Um, so there's no file composition. So everything has to be in one huge file. And so projects like Kubernetes solve that with Helm, where you can include other files and, and, um, and actually do some interpolation and functional operations, which are the next two things. There's no built-in schema to say, when you load this file, I want it to look exactly like this, or it's invalid. That would be great. Um, and there's ways to do serialize arbitrary classes in a lot of implementations. And when you deserialize them or load them, they can lead to um, interesting code execution exploits or denial of service exploits. So yeah, and, and doing things between languages is a little risky. So this YAML script thing that I'm gonna talk about soon can fix all these problems. Um, so the history, like I said, Clark and Oren and I started this in 2001, um, and we got the spec and done around 2000. We spent about five or six years on it every day on email, never met each other, you know, except we finally met each other sometime around 2004 for, for a week, um, and it was cool. Um, and I had met each of them individually, but we've, we only did that all together once. Um, 
Yeah, so we put out the 1.0 spec and then soon after the 1.1 spec, somewhere in there, right around 2006, we learned about JSON and we realized JSON is almost a subset. There's just these three little niggly things, so let's uh, make 1.2 and we'll take out those three little niggly things and now it's a subset. So um, Now I have a new team of uh, four other people, Clark and Oren have moved on to do other things um, and they're great and younger. And um, we put out a non-normative change spec in 2021. And we're, but again, we, the five of us have never met, uh, except on Zoom or whatever. So we're gonna meet in Berlin in two weeks. It's gonna be great. And we're talking about putting out a 1.3 spec. So we'll see, I won't say what's in it because we just don't know. We don't agree on anything, which is kind of like the original team. We never agreed on anything. So who knows about the Norway problem with YAML? It's kind of this famous, infamous problem that people make fun of. So in YAML 1.1, there was 22 ways to say uh, true or false. And one of them was, you know, no was false and um, yes was true. So when you're doing a internationalization mapping like this, you get no and that turns out to a false and it's anyway. So you gotta put a quotes around it and then it's fine. So that's called the Norway problem. It was fixed in 2009 and people still make fun of it, but it's mostly because it was fixed in 1.2 and a lot of the popular implementations are still using 1.1. I think that mostly I think because libyaml uses 1.1 and most stuff has kind of evolved from that. So, um, all right, let's look at some actual examples of weird YAML. Um, so anybody know what's wrong with that document? Let me take a guess. Well, what? Well, I'm not sure what you mean, but let's take a look. So this is called the YAML Playground. It's something I made a few years ago that tests 17 different implementations, parsers of YAML. So um, we'll see later that YAML is actually a seven layer stage. And so the first stage is parsing. Um, and if we look at this, seven of these 17 implementations get it wrong. Now it's even crazier if I delete the final new line so that there's no final new line here, 12 of the parsers. Um, break, which is just crazy. That's not good. Anyway, if I add a space here, then they're all good with it. So basically those literal, I don't know if that's what you meant, but those literal um, scalars have to be indented over one. Well, the problem is YAML defines indentation as starting at negative one. So there's no indentation level yet. So zero is valid indentation. This one right here that I'm going to highlight, this is my reference implementation that's actually generated code from the spec. So it's as good as you can get. It's, I actually spent six months to see if I could generate a parser that passed the entire test suite, which was the first one. <laughs> and, and I did, and it was generated code in several languages. Oh, kind of cool. So let's look at another one. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. Hit the right key. Okay. So what's wrong with this guy? Anybody? It looks like we have a mapping, but we just have, we don't have key values, right? We just have single words. Well, that's actually valid YAML. And what it means is just the keys and it has implicit nulls as the values. It's a little known thing that you can do in, with the flow style and, and um, you can just define keys here and it's fine. And you could assign like three to this one or you, know, you could actually say null would be the same thing or just colon um, would, would be fine. So, that's fine, um, and it leads to the next one. Okay, what's wrong with that? It's kind of the opposite, right? We have this array, but we actually have you know, key value pairs in it. What's going on here? Well, let's take a look. It's actually just defining three one pair mappings. Um, it's a shortcut that Clark came up with in the back of my car when we were driving out to dinner one night. So. He's like, why don't we make it do that? And I'm like, yeah, sure, why not? Um, so, yeah. But this has a problem, and we'll see it in the next one. Uh, let's go back to here. Okay, what's wrong with this? Nobody should do that, but here you can see visually what's wrong with it. Here we go. It's, uh, what, uh, it's, um, it's oh, okay. 
It took a while. And it was all because of my reference implementation, which is totally naive, just generated code from the spec. Um, the spec says that after any ending of array, there, this could be a key, this whole thing, that array could be a key or it could just be a, a, an array. So it could be colon foo there. It's fine. Um, I don't even know if this one's caught up yet. So yeah, so if I added another level of things, it would just, it's, it grows exponentially slow. And it's all just because of the reference parser. Um, the other parsers are not naive, and so, but they're also not correct, fully correct. So, you know. Anyway, and I could make mine less naive. Okay, and then finally, let's look at this guy. I think it's off the screen, so go down here. This is an interesting one because in YAML, you need a colon space to separate a key and a value, but there's no space after this colon. But deep in the spec, it says, well, it doesn't need to be if it's a comma or an ending thing after it. So some of these just can't parse it, but others of them get it wrong. This one thinks the foo is a mapping, but the bar is just a regular scalar. If I was to put spaces after this, they all get it correctly, I think. Well, more of them do. Anyway. <clears throat> um, yeah, so weird YAML. That's the end of that part. Let's go on. So I was saying before, the YAML load stack is actually this, um, it depends on how you want to define it, but basically you read in a file, make it, break it up into code points, Unicode code points, scan them into tokens, parse it into events, create a graph out of those events, go, the resolver goes through and signs a tag internally to every node, and that tag is used up to look at construction function that turns that into something native. And then on the dumper, we pretty much go the opposite way. We don't need all the steps quite, but um, it's kind of, you know, it's like TCP IP, it's this stack kind of protocol thing. So, um, <clears throat> so how do we fix YAML as a whole? I've come around to why, you know, the spec's tough, why not just write all the implementations myself? Now that sounds crazy, right? Um, and it doesn't mean that's the only way to do it, but it's, if I could do it, there's nothing wrong with that. I'm like the crazy one, right? You're not gonna complain. And if it happens to be the best one in every language and exactly the same in every language, Maybe you would use it. Um, I'm not going to say you have to. So check this out. I wrote this thing called PST in the summer of 2022. It's a, I knew that I was going to have to do something like this eventually. So it's a package manager around 42 other package managers, 42 languages, package managers. And I can kind of prove it by, I run this version all command. And um, it's this giant Docker container of stuff. So all of the runtimes are built into PST and you can just start coding in any language and release it. And so technically I could, release to anything by just saying um, PST release in anything, and I wouldn't have to remember how to do it. So it's kind of cool. Okay. Next up, introducing, oh, and so libfyaml is the new lesser known um, libyaml. It's the new C library, and it's awesome. And this guy from Greece, he's part of the Barcore team. And if you're going to do anything with C, I encourage you to use libfyaml, and I want to build so when I talked about implementing everything, everything except those seven layers, except for the constructor, could be done by libfyaml. So it's really not that hard of a problem, right? I just have to write a little bit of construction code um, at the top for each language and then use PST to release all those. So. Um, but in the last year, I came up with YAML script, and that's up next. So let me show you that. So YAML script is a... It's a new programming language. It's syntax is YAML based, and that sounds horrendous. And you know, I mean, everybody that reads it, their first thing is like, "You're this is terrible," or just like, you know, Hacker News is just like, one guy goes, "Oh, it's actually kind of cool when you look at what it actually is." But the, the rest of them were just like trashing it from, you know. Anyway, um, it actually turns out to be quite nice, and I'm quite picky. So the Ingi test down here is that I'm not gonna. I wouldn't even made the language if I didn't like it. I, you know, I, I started playing with things and I'm like, that's not gonna work. And I just kept, and then I'm like, oh, that'll work. And so let's take a look at um, some YAML script. So here's your first YAML script program. This is gonna print 99 bottles of beer on the wall, the, all 99 verses for um, that song, if you know it and you should know it. I sang it at my last talk. Well, um, but. That's not YAML script. That's what GitHub Copilot 
wrote for me when I was writing my slides, right? That was, I'm just like, I have to keep that because it was so precious. That's not even valid YAML, <laughs> okay? So let's look at this. We have a key here for colon, and then we have, well, we have a mapping, but we have an indented, which is, which is the value? Is it this or is it this? Uh, it's neither because it's invalid. We could put that in the playground. Um, if I had more time, I would. Let's see. So. Okay, so let's see what that really looks like. So I, I decided to go with, I actually had a longer version that you'll see two slides ahead, but I went with this. This is the equivalent of what uh, GitHub wanted. So this is looping over 99 to 1, um, assigning to the variable n. And then you say this, it's really nice, you can just say this literal document of this verse. Um, it's interpolated, and so it's uh, $n, you know, 78 bottles of beer in the world, 78 bottles of beer, take one down, pass it around, uh, expression, n minus 1, 77 bottles of beer in the world. So, great. Um, and here's it a little bit more, um, here's my original version. So, uh, I define a function called main, and it takes main, gets called automatically if it exists, and gets past the command line arguments. Um, so this one takes one argument or zero. If it's zero, it, it uh, assigns a default to 99. Loops over those and does the say thing, except instead of you know, saying um, one bottles of beer on the wall, it does the right thing. It says one bottle of beer in English um, by calling the bottles function, um, which runs basically a case statement um, over these things of, of what to print there. And this one has interpolation. So pretty readable and understandable and succinct. And there were no dashes you might notice in that. And in code for YAML scripts, YAML scripts made to be embedded in YAML. And I, I realized I didn't need the dashes. And the dashes are a really clear thing that you're actually looking at data, not, not code. So when it's a, it helps solve amb ambiguity, I'll just mention that. I don't know if I have that in there later. So if you want to, who knows about Rosetta code? Okay, not enough people. RosettaCode.org is this amazing site that has 1,270 languages as of this morning um, and 939 programming languages. It's a matrix, a wiki, and you can people implement all of these tasks in all these languages. It usually has around 10 to 12 percent coverage uh, of things. And people that make new languages like to go in and do all the solutions in this. I've done a few. Um, we'll take a, a look at the page for YAML script. So, yeah, I could, I did these seven or eight, um, but there's, yeah, there's a ton. And I really would like it to encourage other people to do it. So if you want to learn YAML script and help me out, add some examples to this, that'd be great. So, um, also about, God, it's so long ago, 14, I don't know, 12 years ago, I wrote something called um, Rosetta Code Data. I just scraped the whole site and put it into a GitHub repo. So if you want to clone 120,000 programs in whatever it was, 939 languages, you can just clone it in a few seconds from GitHub that way. Um, I run it whenever I remember. I, I don't have it cronned up, so I think I ran it in the last couple months, but anyway. Um, okay. Maybe I'll write a YAML script program to automate this. Let's see. So what are the YAML script's goals for YAML? It's to provide a secure, fast, consistent YAML loader. So there, you know, these exploits I talked about are different in every, you know, nobody knows what to expect. Um, for every language that uses YAML, I want to have that. I have eight out so far, those eight. Um, I want to offer the missing features that YAML users are constantly asking the mail, you know, our forums about um, why can't I concatenate these arrays? Because it's a data language. Can you do that in JSON? No, then you can't do it in YAML. And they say that because we added one function, merge, that, I don't know, it was Clark's idea. He's like, why don't we make this merge thing? So we have this one function that's kind of in the spec in 1.1, and I don't know. Anyway, so and some implementations do it, and they all do it differently. It's kind of... Um, <clears throat> let's see. I want to offer a schema definition. I want you to be able to easily, a lot easier than JSON schema, define exactly um, what you expect to load and have it error right away if, 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 you if you try to load something different and explain it very clearly you know, what you did wrong. So you know, Ansible could define their Ansible schema and um, it would tell you right away exactly what you did wrong, that kind of thing. 
Um, and YAML script ties into some extension libraries. And you'll find out, I think, on the next screen how that's even possible, because I've only been doing this for nine months. How could I have extension libraries? Well, oh, it's on the next slide. Okay. Um, YAML script has goals for programming. It's a functional language, and it's a really nice intro, I think, to functional programming. If you're not used to any immutable data structures and that kind of stuff, you can't. When, I, when you saw um, assigning to variables, that's not really what you're doing. Um, you're doing this lispy let type of thing. Um, but it works out really well. Um, I want it to be good for uh, well, data and code live together, scripting for automation. I'll show you a, a really nice automation later. Um, Oh, there it goes. That was the secret slide. Um, compiles to binary executables. It literally will compile. You can have you know, a one-line YAML script program, and it will compile to binary, and you can ship it that way if you want. Um, and, but I really want to sh compile it to shared libraries so that I can write something in YAML script and then publish it in 42 languages, which is my acneism dream, right? So, um, OK, so this is the big secret. YAML script is closure in disguise. Every YAML script file, including a data file, compiles to closure and then is evaluated as closure. Now closure, if you, who knows closure with a J? Not too many people. Okay, it's, a, it's been around for 15 years. It's, um, it's a way to do functional Lisp programming in the JVM. And I mean, it's an industry, it's big in the industry. People, I know it's got a huge community, lots of jobs do. Um, I found out CircleCI is implemented all in closure. Um, but it compiles to the JVM, so it was written over the, the Java ecosystem. And so now you're thinking, well, who programs Java here? Nobody, yeah, N neither did I. I, and I still don't, but um, except through Closure. So there's this thing, who's, who's heard of GraalVM from Oracle, which sounds terrible to say at an open source conference, but they have a good license that all my open source friends are comfortable with. Um, it can take anything compiled from any Java language to a jar, it can turn that into binary executable with instant startup time, very fast startup time. And so YAML script, when you download it, it's just a standalone YS program that has, it's completely um, a, a standalone binary. So, so that's great. Um, so let's, let's so here's a closure program that has to spin up the JVM and it takes about, usually about, 0.4 seconds to do. This is 20 times faster, 19 milliseconds to start a YAML script program. Um, and if I compile this again, this is what it compiles to. That's closure code compiled from YAML script code. And sometimes the Java currently bleeds through, like the error messages often have Java in them because even though there's no Java being run, it was all compiled from Java jar files with these error messages in it. So I'll run a few programs here. So this is the help for the YS command. Um, it's the current version that I released a couple days ago. Here's that 99 bottles of beer on the wall, very fast. Uh, with, I passed it the argument three. Um, here I'll say hello world. Here I will grab a environment variable and say hello Ingi. Um, and here I will compile that. So that's what it looks like compiled. Um, here I'm gonna reverse the numbers zero through 10 and nothing prints, it's because I didn't tell it to print anything. So I could solve it by using the say command and print those, or I could just add the minus print, which will um, show the last evaluation value of that. Um, I could go through all these. These are some different, at the bottom, different ways to write the same thing. Oh, this one's kind of interesting because here I'm saying, hey, this isn't code, this is data. And so it's just gonna load that as, you know, that was actual YAML. That's what you get if you loaded that as a YAML file, right? Um, just a, a, a string and another string. This is an unquoted string. So, okay. So <clears throat> here's how easy it is to install YAML script depending on how good the network is. Okay, that was great. So you just um, curl the install thing, pipe it to bash. It's just taken from GitHub releases. Um, Okay, so running a program is just doing it for side effects like we saw, and loading a program is trying to get the value that it produces. Um, so there's two syntax modes, and you're constantly kind of switching between them. Um, like if I have the word say, is that a string or is that the command say? The, um, so if you're in code mode, it's say. If you're in data mode, then it's string. And so that's kind of the trick to programming YAML script well inside of YAML is to know which mode you're in. 
Um, all, val all YAML script files, all YAML files are valid YAML script files already. Um, and they all start in bare mode, which means they can never go to code mode, so you'll never get code execution without a special tag. That tag is bang YAML script that you put at the top, actually bang YAML script v0, which will become stable soon, and then we'll move on to v1. That way we can do new interesting stuff, but anybody using v0 will work forever. Um, yeah. I'm going a little faster because I'm running out of time, and I've got some cool stuff to show you. So. Let's just look at, this is uh, starting in data mode. These things are all strings, but if I want to switch to code mode and you know, evaluate this, capitalize this um, environment variable, I just say bang. And bang looks kind of weird, so if it's in a mapping pair, you can just say uh, double colon, and it's the same as bang. And it looks a little cleaner. And here's something starting in, oh, I'll run this. There you go. Um, here, I'm starting in code mode, so I have a, I'm assigning the variable A, the letters, or the strings, O, Y, N, and E, and I'm going to um, join them here to make the word one, um, then the literal word two, and then I'm going to take a random number N and repeat it ten times as a string. And, but if it's less than five, I'm going to do that. If it's greater than five, I'll print N as big. So let's run this a couple times. Okay, 10 is big, 9 is big, and there we go, 10 ones. We combine those letters and form the letter one. So, anyway, just some dumb tricks, dumb YAML script tricks. Okay. Okay, this one's kind of cool. So, here I have three files, and let's look at this file. This file has two documents in it, and then the first one, I'm actually pulling in stuff from other files. Um, this one I'm just defining a literal, but I'm assigning names to each of these data points that I can reuse later in another document without having those pull-ins be part of this document. So this is all going to evaluate to the last document, but here I've pulled in um, some small and big dogs, and here I'm going to take the, for instance, I'm going to take the pointer to the dogs, pull off the big key, and then shuffle those dogs up and take the first two. That's what I'm doing there. So, um, and let's, uh, let's see. And so, this is the file that's on disk, and this is the file that actually gets pulled over from a curl command. And that curl command is not a system curl. That's actually from the YAML script standard library curl. It does the same thing. So, let's go ahead and run that. Well, I can compile it to closure. I'll go ahead and run it. And it paused for a second because it was doing the curl. Otherwise, it would have been way quicker. So, um, and we see we got two dogs, the Great Dane and St. Bernard. This time, we got the St. Bernard and the Otterhound. Okay. So, and this is what it looks like using it from Python. So, it's just, just a regular YAML loader. Um, All right, well, I got two minutes, so let, let me just skip to the, to the fun part. So, um, and I'll end with this. Okay, there we go. So, in Closer, there's this VS Code plugin called um, Calva, and it's awesome. And I, I wrote all this code in Calva, and I'm friends with the author. He actually was pulled me into the Closer community after seeing another talk that I gave to the Perl community. And so he had this giant, well, 700 line circle CI YAML file, and it was a big mess. And I'll show you what it looks like. Um, so there it is. It's just a bunch of data and bash. There's a whole lot of bash, okay? Um, and I'll show you the results. So I refactored this over 30 commits. Um, you can see, well, those are the, I don't, um, and I ended up with this. So basically, the main thing is the config.ys. It generates the exact same config YAML that CircleCI is expecting, but instead of starting with that, I start with this. So up here, these are the different kind of steps that I'm pulling in. Um, these are the workflow names. And then down here, 
I pull in a bunch of files and, and, and manipulate them to create that whole mess that you saw. And all of the um, jobs are in YAML files separated out, and all of the bin files are bash scripts. And now that they're bash scripts, I can lint them with shell check. So I do a make test, and it will run shell check on all of those files, and they're all clean. They weren't clean when I pulled them out, so I had to tweak them. And I'm, I like bash, so I worked on that. Anyway, um, I'm going to end it there. Um, and thank you all for your time. And uh, if anybody has questions, I think we're at the end, right? I got five minutes? All right, I'm going to open it up to questions, so because I don't ever get to do that. So, if anybody have questions? <laughs> Sorry, that was a lot to take in. Yes. Does it what? Oh, macros. Yes, that's a great question. Yes. So, um, there is a macro system coming. Um, and I actually do it internally. I'm, I'm still trying to come up with the right syntax. But So a macro system in Lisp, you can change the syntax of Lisp slightly. And um, there's certain functions, like the cons function we saw that there was that case thing. Um, usually, you take the whole pair and you put parens around it. But in this case, you want parens around either side. So I use the macro facility to do that. But I want people to be able to write their own things such that, hey, I'm, I want my YAML to be look like this for this kind of function. And you can do with that with the macro system, but it's still uh, probably a month away. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Thank you for the great, great presentation. So, how to debug YAML scripts? How did I? How to debug? Debug. debug. Oh, debug YAML script. That's a really great question. Um, let me see if I can. I can just show you why I, with the minus D flag. So, why it says a minus D. Um, so let's just say, say, colon one, two, three. Okay, so these are all, that's the stack. So this is the parse level, and this is actually how I test it, too. I have lots of tests for all the compilation possibilities. Um, and this is the, so this is one of the ways that I debug it, and you can, um, yeah, cool. Any other questions? Any YAML questions? Or? Yes. With YAML 1.2 having been out for 15 years and uh, some of the major languages not updating their libraries to use that, is are you do you have any plans on being able to help those languages adopt uh, these changes faster, or to be able to keep up to date with? That's a really good question. You can't really change the language too much and expect. I mean, there's a lot of work that people did to make these implement. Sorry, the question. I guess everybody heard the question. Anyway. Um, so we have a test suite, and actually the changes that we're looking at from my standpoint, I want 1.3 to be very small changes. All those weirdo things that I was showing you. Um, and actually, it's not so bad because all of the implementations differ. So I'm not, even on the things where I'm making something that's spec backwards incompatible implementation, it's just kind of a mess. So I'm just clarifying it, and it's I don't expect to break much. And also, um, I don't know if that really answers your question, but... Yeah, I'm quite aware of uh, making it possible. And also, I'll have the reference implementation uh, via YAML script and related things. And libf.yaml will have that ready to go. So if you're just binding around the C library, it shouldn't be too hard. Well, thank you very much. I uh, appreciate your time.